So hello everyone and welcome. Uh, my name is Megan. I am a senior library assistant at Kitchener Public Library. I work at the downtown location uh, in Queen Street in Kitchener and I'm here tonight. Tonight we are joined uh, by some lovely folks, Briley and Vanessa from Parks Canada and they're going to be our presenters. This is our third session in our Camping 101 series. It is the Rouge, Canada's first national urban park. And the Lovely Parks Canada team will be taking over shortly. We encourage lots of questions. So if you have them, please do drop them into the uh, chat uh, or the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. If you hover over, you can see those options there. Um, and we are recording tonight's program. So hopefully you'll see it up in the near future on our KPL YouTube page. So without further ado, take it away, Parks Canada. Thank you, Megan, for the warm welcome. And thank you to the Kitchener Public Library for hosting us today. We're very excited to be here. I'm just going to pull up my presentation now. There we go. Can everyone see that OK? Perfect. So hello, bonjour, um, good afternoon. Welcome to the presentation about the Rouge, Canada's first national urban park. Uh, thank you so much for joining us today. My name is Briley and my pronouns are she and her. And I'm a part of the Learn to Camp team here with Parks Canada. And I'm working out of the Rouge National Urban Park here in Toronto. I'm also here with my coworker who will introduce themselves now. Hi everyone, I'm Vanessa and I'll be here today to answer some questions and I'll be putting some links in the chat throughout the presentation. Thanks Vanessa. So Parks Canada would like to acknowledge that Rouge National Urban Park is built on the ancestral land of many nations. Some of these nations include the Haudenosaunee, the Anishinaabe, Huron Wendat, and Mississaugas of the Credit. At the Rouge National Urban Park, we are very proud to be working closely with 10 First Nations through the First Nations Advisory Circle. We do this through the establishment, uh, the planning, and the management of the park as well. Uh, we also work closely with our First Nation partners on a number of important projects, including archaeological fieldwork, restoration projects, and the development of visitor facilities. So since we're all on a video call today and not in the Rouge National Urban Park, we would like to encourage you to learn the history of the land in your area by exploring the native.ca um, website. You can see a screenshot of it here on the screen. It's a great website where you can learn more about different treaties and languages as well in your region. Um, you can also read from Indigenous Voices directly, and Vanessa will be pro providing um, a link in the chat to a book list that highlights Indigenous authors. So here you can see um, a beautiful painting by the Anishinaabe artist Norval Morisot. And this is their painting called Floral Theme in Two Parts. So the symmetry uh, in this painting uh, depicts birds, butterflies, flowers, and berries, and it uh, represents the balance in nature. So Norvell is considered by many to be the Mishomis or the uh, grandfather of contemporary Indigenous art in Canada. And Norvell believes that people live in relationship with animals, plants, the earth, and the spiritual world, um, which is a conviction shared by many Indigenous communities. So to me, as a settler on Anishabe land, um, this painting really represents a reciprocal relationship. Uh, visually, you can see how all living things are dependent on one another. And I think it's a great starting point to consider the, re the relationship um, that you have with the land that you have settled on. So whether you look into Indigenous artists, um, Indigenous authors, or check out that website, there's lots of ways to engage. Um, and become more informed as well. So a little outline of today's presentation. Uh, so today we'll be introducing Parks Canada and then we'll dive deeper into information about the Rouge National Urban Park. And I'll touch on some topics such as park history, uh, its work and how to stay connected along with some others. So here is a beautiful photo of Fundy National Park in New Brunswick. 
And this photo highlights the Red Parks Canada chairs, which can be found at national parks across the country. So if you get the chance to visit, see if you can find them and take a photo of them while you're there. So Parks Canada was the world's first national park service. It was founded on May 19th, 1911, uh, which makes us about 110 years old. And we protect 450,000 kilometers square of land in Canada, which is about eight times the size of Nova, of Nova Scotia. So here on the screen, you can see a little look at the Parks Canada mandate. Um, so on behalf of the people of Canada, we protect and present nationally significant examples of Canada's natural and cultural heritage. We also foster public understanding, appreciation, and enjoyment in ways that ensure their ecological and commemorative integrity for present and future generations. So here you can see a map that shows the location of all of our protected areas across the country. The Parks Canada delivers its mandate through national parks, national historic sites, and national marine conservation areas which I'll explore a bit more of these in more detail. So the first way we deliver Parks Canada's mandate is through national parks. And Canada's national parks are some of the most iconic and treasured places in the country. Uh, they provide critical habitat to countless species of plants and animals, and they also give Canadians opportunities to connect with nature. So Parks Canada conserves and protects 48 national parks across the country, uh, the oldest of which is Banff National Park, which was established in 1885. So Banff is among the oldest national parks in the world, along with Yellowstone National Park in the United States and uh, Royal National Park in Australia. Uh, parks Canada also co-manages many national parks and marine conservation areas alongside Indigenous people. Um, some examples of these are Guayanas National Park Reserve, National Marine Conservation Area, and Haida Heritage Site in British Columbia, as well as Sermalik National Park in Nunavut. So we have a poll question here for everyone. We'd love to know how many national parks have you visited before? There's a couple options to choose from. Megan, are we able to launch that poll? Thank you. So give everyone a moment to answer. So it looks like no one's had the chance to answer, um, but I hope you're able to put in the chat maybe a park you visited before. Um, if you haven't visited any, that's okay too. I'm sure after this presentation, you'll be inspired to visit at least one. Awesome. All right, so here I have another image of a different map. This time it's the map of Ontario. Uh, so the green dots on this map indicate national parks, the yellow dots indicate national historic sites, and the blue areas are the national marine conservation areas. And if you can see the purple dot, number 21, beside Toronto, that's the Rouge National River Park. Uh, so you can see here, um, Ontario, in Ontario, we are fortunate to have five different national parks. Even though they're a little far from Toronto, they're definitely worth checking out. But what makes the Rouge so special is that um, its proximity to the greater Toronto area. Um, so the Rouge is a perfect gateway to discovering other national parks across Canada as well. So the second way that we deliver Parks Canada's mandate is through national historic sites. Uh, so Parks Canada preserves and manages 171 of Canada's more than 970 national historic sites across the country. 
So this includes national treasures uh, such as Bar U Ranch in Alberta, uh, Fiskard Lighthouse in British Columbia, and Manoir Papineau in Quebec. So the closest national historic sites uh, to the Rouge or the Greater Toronto area are, um, that are managed by Parks Canada are the HMCS Haida in Hamilton. Um, and there's also a cluster of five sites in Niagara on the lake, which include Fort George, Fort Mississauga, Mississauga Point, Butler's Barracks, and the battlefield of Fort George as well. So many of Canada's newest national historic sites that are managed by Parks Canada reflect the history and culture of Indigenous people and the diverse cultural uh, communities who make up Canada. So in the 1980s, uh, Parks Canada entered the domain of marine ecosystems and today manages four national marine conservations across the country. Uh, these, floor, these four um, national marine conservations include Guayanas in British Columbia, Saguenay St. Lawrence in Quebec, Lake Superior um, in Ontario, and Fathom 5 in Ontario as well. So national marine conservation areas are an important area of conservation because Canada has such a rich marine heritage. We also have the longest coastline in the world. Um, it's more than 243 kilometers long, um, along three oceans, plus 9,500 kilometers along the Great Lakes. So lots of waterfront here. Um, the National Marine Conservation Areas also have a distinct combination of physical and biological characteristics. Uh, they include submerged lands um, and the water above them, such as wetlands, estuaries, islands, and other coastal lands. When you're visiting National Marine Conservation Areas, you will learn and see the protection of seabeds, the water, uh, marine and coastal habitats, and a diversity of terrestrial and aquatic species. There's also many geological, archaeological, and historical features that are unique to each conservation area. Uh, for example, at Fathom 5, there are even some shipwrecks that have been conserved. So this beautiful picture was taken half an hour away from Toronto City Centre at one of the last remaining working farms in the Greater Toronto Area, which is located inside the Rouge National Urban Park. So now I'll talk a bit more about the Rouge. So there was a lot of environmental conservation history at the Rouge National Urban Park before Parks Canada came into the picture. Uh, so to begin in 1954, Hurricane Hazel caused flooding and property damage leading to the formation of conservation authorities across the province of Ontario to help manage and protect land and communities from future flood damage. So the Toronto and Region Conservation Authority, also known as the TRCA, was created uh, to protect and manage watersheds um, in the Greater Toronto Area, which includes the Rouge watershed as well. The original Rouge Park uh, was established by the province of Ontario in 1995, and it was about 50 kilometers square. It was um, also managed by the TRCA, the Toronto Region and Conservation Authority. Um, and then later, the Rouge Park Alliance was formed by advocacy from the Scarborough community, among others, and the work of notable individuals in response to a growing demand for recreational trails throughout these protected areas. So the decision um, for Rouge Park to become a national park was made in 2011 after a study determined that creating a national park would be the best way to protect and manage the growing number of protected areas inside and nearby the park. So the Government of Canada and the neighbouring uh, municipalities of Markham, York, Durham and Pickering, they each contributed lands to what became the Rouge National Urban Park. And while Toronto and surrounding cities began to develop and expand, uh, we saw many groups and important figures fight for the protection of Rouge Park. And without their hard work and dedication in the past, Canada's first national urban park may never have existed. So thank you so much to all of those ded dedicated volunteers who really made this happen. 
Uh, so once Rouge Park came to existence, we continued having more volunteers uh, who dedicated their time to help protect the park and assist with work being done at the Rouge under the Rouge Park Alliance. All right, so here is a history of, of the park through the Parks Canada lens. Um, so the Rouge National Urban Park has changed a lot over the years. Um, and here's a look at what that has looked like. So Parks Canada first committed to work towards the creation of the Rouge um, in 2011. And since then, the agency has consulted with more than 20,000 Canadians and has been working closely with First Nations, all levels of government and community groups, uh, also conservationists, farmers, and residents to really realize the dream of creating Canada's first national urban park. Then in 2013 to 2015, the lands were still owned by various entities, uh, which you can see here on the screen. So they were owned by Ontario, Toronto, Markham, and so on. Uh, then in June 2014, um, a draft management plan was released for public review. Uh, so a draft management plan is a document that will guide the management of the park over a 10 year period. Next, in May 2015, the Rouge National Urban Park was officially created. Um, and when the Rouge National Urban Park Act came into force by ordering council. So the official uh, first land transfer came from Transport Canada which saw about 19 kilometers square become Rouge National Park's very first lands. So this was a very exciting moment for the Rouge. Then um, by June 2019, the Rouge National Urban Park received 95% of its total expected lands. And today, 97% of these land transfers are complete. And Parks Canada is working hard to encourage visitors to protect this special place. Uh, while we improve and establish visitor centers, um, amenities such as restrooms, wayfinding signage, trails, and day use areas as well. So here's a bit of the same history, just in a timeline form of the park's development throughout the past decade. Um, so some major points to note um, are the First Nation Advisory Circle was established, um, then after that, we, there you could see um, lots of different land transfers that happened. Um, and then by August, we're also looking um, to create an education and welcome center. So we're continuing um, to develop the park as the years go on. So as of today, Parks Canada manages 75 kilometers squared of the 79 kilometers squared of the lands intended for the Rouge National Urban Park. So once the land transfers are completed, the Rouge National Urban Park will be the largest urban park in North America. Uh, just for a bit of context, this is 23 times larger than Central Park in New York and 19 times larger than Stanley Park in Vancouver. So it's a very large park. You can see a photo of it here on the screen. Um, so it goes all the way from Lake Ontario in the south, uh, the beach up north, past the zoo, and into an area called the Oak Ridges Moraines, where there are lots of hills and farmland. So as you can see in the photo, um, the park crosses many communities, um, including the township of Uxbridge, the city of Pickering, the city of Toronto, Markham, and the town of Whitchurch Stouffville as well. So why create a national urban park in Toronto? Well, more than 7 million Canadians, which is about 20% of Canada's population, lives in the greater Toronto area, with the nearest national parks being around a three hour drive away. So with the creation of the Rouge National Urban Park, the largest city in the country now has a national urban park that is within an hour drive away. And it's always accessible um, and always free to visit. So we're very proud of that. So some different ways to reach the park. Um, we are the only national protected area accessible by public transit. 
So you can take the GO train, the subway, um, there's some TTC bus stops as well. Um, some main access points with parking include the Zoo Road welcome area, the Reeser Road and 19th Avenue day use area. Um, so you can find more information on how to get here on our website. So here's a list of some activities that you can do in the park. Uh, the first one you can see here is hiking. So there's currently 15 different hiking trails throughout the Rouge. Uh, most of these trails are ranked as easy or moderate with great views of marshes, rivers, bluffs, and meadows. Uh, Vanessa will provide a link in the chat for you to explore some of these hikes. Next, we have cycling. So the park's farmland and its forests provide a lovely rural atmosphere and a sense that you're um, far away from the city. There's also a few traffic lights um, to interrupt your ride while the gentle rolling hills offer a nice workout. So please note that uh, cycling is not permitted on hiking trails and this is in order to protect um, sensitive natural ecosystems and reduce trail erosion. So instead, uh, the park's road network offers excellent opportunities for cyclists to explore the area. Uh, next, you can see we have camping. Um, unfortunately, right now, the campground is under, under um, renovations. But check back next summer uh, for opportunities to camp in the only campground in the greater Toronto area. Up next is fishing. Uh, so the mouth of the Rouge River and the surrounding marsh area are really popular fishing spots. Um, so fishing is permitted in the park as long as you have a valid Ontario fishing license. And if you don't like fishing, well, swimming is always an option. So a refreshing swim at the Rouge Beach is also a popular activity on a hot summer de uh, day. Um, you can enjoy the smooth, sandy beach and cool waters of Lake Ontario. Um, next, we have bird watching. Uh, bird watching is a fun activity that you can do all year round. And all you really need is a pair of binoculars and a bird guide or maybe an app to help with identification. Lastly, we have um, an activity where you can learn about Indigenous cultures and their history. So the Rouge is home to many historic and significant travel paths and Indigenous peoples use these paths since time immemorial. Um, running from community to community and delivering messages for protection, um, for ritual, and for sport. So what makes a national urban park unique? Well, the concept of a national urban park was something new for Parks Canada, and the creation of Rouge National Urban Park is monumental because it is Canada's first and only national urban park. Uh, the Rouge also has many roads and two 400 series highways and railways that serve freight trains and commuter trains as well. And it's also home to some of the last few working farms in the greater Toronto area. So the Rouge is a large natural space that is surrounded by some urban development and it is special because it has some of the last working farms in the greater Toronto area. So Parks Canada protects and conserves the natural, cultural, as well as the agricultural heritage of the park. So the Rouge is home to Toronto's largest remaining wetland and rare Carolinian forest. Uh, there's over 1,700 species of plants and animals that live in the Rouge. You can see a breakdown of those species on the screen here. So there are 762 different plant species. Uh, some of these include white pine, uh, trilliums and water lilies. There's also 225 different bird species. Um, some of these are American goldfinch, Baltimore oriole, woodpeckers, blue jays, cardinals, and red-tailed hawks. Um, there's also 55 different fish species. Um, some common ones are salmon, trout, and pike. Then there's 27 different animal species, which include deer, coyote, rabbits, beavers, and finally, uh, 19 reptile and amphibian species like turtle, frogs, and snakes. 
Um, so here are some pictures of some of the species that we protect at the Rouge, and we also rely on visitors to help us. So a bit about our cultural heritage. Um, there's over 10,000 years of human history in the Rouge, and there's an abundance of cultural heritage. Uh, many First Nations, likely the Huron-Wendat, the Haudenosaunee, and the Anishinaabe, have been living, hunting, fishing, um, and cultivating crops, such as squash, maize, uh, and beans on the land. Uh, the Rouge River was being used as a means of transportation and later as a trade route uh, known as the Carrying Place Trail, which also includes the Humber River. So the reason we do not have more information about First Nations history at the Rouge is due to the outcomes of past policies and actions which erased Indigenous cultures and traditions. Um, Parks Canada is working towards reconciliation. For example, in July, the Government of Canada recognized the national historical significance of the formal Shingwak Residential School and the Muskaukwin Indian Residential School. Uh, they inaugurated a new exhibit created in partnership with the Huron-Wendat Nation at the St. Louis Forts and Chateau um, National Historic Site. They also unveiled a new Indigenous tourism project at the St. Louis Forts and Chateau National Historic Site. Uh, Vanessa will be providing a link in the chat to learn more information about residential schools. And while these actions are only the beginning towards reconciliation, we recognize that much more is needed to be done. So at the Rouge National Urban Park, uh, we work with 10 First Nation communities who sit on the First Nations Advisory Committee, also known as FNAC. Um, these include the Seven Williams Treaties Nations, um, which you can see here on the screen, as well as Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation, Six Nations of the Grand River, and the Huron-Wendat First Nation. So the formation of the First Nations Advisory Circle ensures that we are able to protect the cultural heritage of the Rouge from the past to the present and into the future. Um, and they play a vital role to the park because they are consulted on with the activities and, and the decisions of the park. So the park works with FNAC on many different projects throughout the Rouge. Um, I'll go over some now. The first is our annual FNAC meetings. Um, these are usual, usually annual and or biannual meetings, depending on the field unit needs. Um, and they have time for a full round table sharing with discussions about ongoings in the park related to visitor experience, resource conservation, capital and asset projects and more. Uh, so FNAC meeting is also an important way for the Rouge National Urban Park to fulfill our duty to consult and build relationships with our First Nation partners. Next, we have employee awareness. So we have a wonderful Indigenous relations team, which regularly engages with the Rouge staff to build awareness and education on Indigenous issues and topics. So for example, the Indigenous relations team has hosted uh, movies, uh, or short film screenings, um, hosted guest speakers with an Indigenous artist from FNAC, and also discussed topics such as Indigenous Toronto. Um, the ind uh, Indigenous Relations team um, also conducts weekly media scans to raise awareness about the latest news in Indigenous relations. And finally, uh, we also work with project engagement so the First Nations Advisory Circle field liaisons join the Rouge archaeological team on site to conduct field work. Uh, there's also engagement on the future Rouge National Urban Park Visitor Learning and Community Center. Um, so the park's flagship welcome area has been in full engagement mode since early 2021, with over 50 hours of engagement with FNAC members. And lastly, uh, the Stories of Canada project. Uh, so this is a funding opportunity through national office that will allow uh, the Rouge to work with dedicated FNAC community representatives to work on park projects, including um, 
the Rouge Gateway to collaborate and share the stories of their respective indigenous cultures in a meaningful and empowering way. So a bit about agricultural heritage. Um, in the late 1800s, farmers from Pennsylvania moved to Canada and started to develop their farming roots in Ontario. And some of them continue to farm in the Rouge Valley today. So as European culture settled on the land, um, more farming was established. Um, orchards, livestock were also brought in and roads were established as different boroughs of Toronto grew. Uh, since then, communities nearby the Rouge and the Rouge Parks Alliance uh, have been protecting from urban development and Parks Canada has since stepped in to protect, conserve and manage the area. Uh, so many farms in the Rouge are located on class one soil, which is the rarest and most fertile soil in Canada. Um, the Rouge is different from all other Parks Canada sites and locations because Parks Canada has made it a point and also relies on visitors to protect the agricultural lands in the Rouge. So some of our agricultural objectives are to continue um, the existing farming, diversification of farming, incorporate uh, beneficial management practices, really maintain a lived in landscape. Uh, we also would love to recognize the farming's contribution to the park's natural and cultural heritage and its conservation and establishment of long-term relationships between the farming community and Parks Canada. So next I will talk about a few examples of some past and ongoing projects at the Rouge. So here is a bit of a story about our Blanding's turtle recovery. So currently, uh, sadly, Blanding's turtles are considered a threatened species in Canada and Ontario. Uh, Blanding's turtles can live up to 80 years and they are always smiling. They're nicknamed the smiling turtle because of the yellow under the chin that makes it look like they are smiling. Uh, turtles play an important role in many indigenous people's spiritual uh, beliefs and ceremonies. Um, to many Algonquin and Iroquois speaking peoples, um, turtles are a teacher and play an integral role in the creation story by allowing the earth to be formed on its back. Uh, the 13 spots on the shell often represent the 13 full moons of the year. Uh, there are also legends on how the Blanding turtle got its yellow chin. And in many indigenous stories, uh, the turtle is referred as the turtle with the sun under its chin. So if you're interested in learning more about these stories or uh, traditional ecological knowledge, our partners at the Toronto Zoo and their collaborators put together a ways of knowing guide uh, which Vanessa has provided a link in the chat for you. So here's a little look at the timeline of our Blanding's Turtle Recovery Project. So it began in 2014 when we worked with partners to release 10 turtles into the park. Um, since then, you can see we have been increasing that number ever since. Um, as of today, we have released 322 two-year-old Blanding's turtles as part of the Head Start program and 184 hatchling Blanding's turtles into a variety of wetland habitats in the Rouge. So this number will hopefully keep on increasing as well. So a bit more about the Head Start project. Um, so Parks Canada is working with many partners like the Toronto Zoo and adopt a -Pond to raise the population of Blanding's turtles to a stable level. So Toronto Zoo is leading the Head Start project where the eggs of Blanding's turtles um, are taken from healthy populations in Canada and then are brought to the Toronto Zoo to grow for the next two years. So while they're at the zoo, they don't hibernate and they keep growing over the winter until they re uh, reach the size of um, a two-year-old turtle, which is equivalent to a four-year-old Blanding's turtle in the wild. So this helps them have a better chance at survival. Another project that we are proud of is our restoration planting. So last year, there was even more restoration and farmland enhancement in the park. 
Uh, to date, 77 ecological restoration projects have been completed in the Rouge, uh, which saw more than 71 hectares of wetlands, um, riparian and forest habitats restored. So in collaboration with our partners, more than 56,000 native trees and shrubs will be planted this year in the park. Um, and the tree planting at the Rouge is a collaboration between Parks Canada, the TRCA and Forest Ontario, and it was made possible by the Government of Canada's Two Billion Trees Commitment. So the next project is our archaeology. Um, so the Rouge conducts archaeological fieldwork projects on sites throughout the park. Uh, there's approximately 326 registered settler and indigenous archaeological sites at the park. A date from the archaic period, which is around 7000 BC to 1000 BC, through to the contact period and well into the 20th century. So archaeological assessment is part of the impact assessment process that is required by law in Canada before any development work can take place. This ensures that important cultural sites are understood and protected where needed. It's important to remember um, that while archaeology um, is one way to learn more about the history at the park, it can't represent a full fit, uh, picture of the cultural and historical heritage of the area. Um, much of the indigenous history and cultural heritage of the area cannot be documented through archaeology, but especially as visitors, it's important that we recognize and acknowledge the history and heritage of the park. So here are some ways to stay connected with us. Um, always check our website for the most up-to-date information. These activities are currently not available due to COVID, but hopefully we can resume in the future. Um, some of these include our guided walks. Uh, so you can see a picture here on the screen of a Parks Canada staff helping a visitor um, identify birds. Um, so that is one option or one activity that you can take part in. Next, we have community festivals. Um, in the past, we've had a festival called Taste of the Rouge, and this is where um, a lot of the farming community shows up, and you're able to taste um, different crops that are being grown in the Rouge. Uh, next, we have stewardship events. So that includes uh, beach cleanups and different ways to engage um, with taking care of the park. Um, next, we have Learn to Camp overnight camping trips in the park. Um, I was fortunate to um, lead some of these overnight events two years ago, and they're an absolute great time, especially for beginner campers who have never camped before. Um, we provide all the equipment necessary, and we will walk you through um, how to use it all. So if you're interested in learning how to camp, that's a great option as well. And finally, you can always stay connected to us um, through our social media. So some of the ways you can help the Rouge during COVID, um, the first I already mentioned it is to always check the website before you go. Uh, this will really give you the most up to date information. Uh, next, you want to visit during downtimes. Um, so these include early mornings, late evenings or during the week. Usually around 10 to 2 is the peak time where we get lots of visitors. Um, so the best thing you can do is to visit during our downtimes that are outside of those times. Also, please always carry a mask with you and keep your distance from others. Just follow standard COVID protocols. Um, you can also try visiting other areas of the park. So many of our visitors uh, like to stay in the south end near the beach. We also have lots of great trails and areas to explore in the north of the park. So this just helps um, spread out our visitors a bit more. So instead of sticking to one area, maybe try exploring a different area. And please remember, um, never litter, dump garbage, or harvest in the park. We really want to keep it as clean as possible, so please take everything you bring with you. So if you'd like um, any information about any of the topics I covered today, you can always visit our website, which I've been talking about. You can see it here on the screen. It's uh, parkscanada.gc.ca. We also have um, an email and phone number you can contact us at. And like I said before, you can stay in contact with us through our social media. 
Um, so please follow us on Twitter and or Facebook. So that brings us to the end of the presentation, but we do have some time here to answer a few questions. Um, so if anyone had any in the chat or if you'd like to ask them out loud now, please feel free to go ahead. Uh, the only question we saw in the chat uh, was about Learn to Camp. And this is a Learn to Camp session right now that we're in uh, a virtual format instead of in person. Is that correct? Yeah, so this is part of our Learn to Camp program. Um, as you can see, I haven't been talking about camping. Uh, this is mostly about the Rouge, but we do have other presentations that are camping focused. Um, but if you mean uh, the Learn to Camp overnight event, um, there's no chance of that happening in 2021. Uh, we're really hoping that it can start again in 2022. Okay. Um, if nobody else has any questions, uh, I would love to know more about farming in the Rouge and um, what kinds of things people are growing there um, and maybe kind of the difficulties of urban farming. If you For sure. Like yeah, yeah. So um, some of the popular crops that are being grown in the park are soybeans and corn. Uh, there's also a lot of winter wheat. Um, those are the ones that are probably produced on a bigger scale. But there's also a lot of really cute um, smaller farms that you can visit. Um, Vanessa lives close to the farm. Have you ever visited at any of them? Yeah, there's um, a few farms that are, I think, uh, most of them are private, but there used to be this one really big part public farm and they had lots of, um, like your own um, vegetables and fruits and things. And they, yeah, they had a lot of different types of crops. It's like they had berries, they had um, potatoes and like um, other like vegetables like zucchini. Yeah. I think um, there's a lot of different types of crops that can grow in the rouge, but like Riley said, like um, corn and like soybeans and those kinds of things are like more popular, I think. Well, if nobody else has any other questions, this is your last kind of moment, folks. Um, I wanna thank both Riley and Vanessa for an excellent presentation. Um, as we mentioned, this was the third in the series from the library, so there is one more. It is happening on uh, Thursday, August 5th at 1.30, and it is Camping Safety, How to Protect Yourself and the Environment. Um, so you'll see more of the Parks Canada crew then, but until then, you can check out our YouTube channel to view the other sessions that we've had um, and hopefully get out to a Parks Canada Park sometime this summer. Have a great evening, everyone, and thanks again.